Okay. Good morning. The uh, December 9th uh, curriculum instruction meeting will now be called to order. And um, I think instead of jumping right into public comment, we'll start with a few introductions. Um, so briefly, I'm Karen Yoho, Vice President of the Board and Chair of this committee. And I'll pass it to uh, Ms. Johnson. Hi, I'm Sue Johnson, a new member of the board. And uh, I very much uh, appreciate everyone uh, working with me as I get up to speed and learn how things work. And uh, really excited to uh, uh, help uh, make sure that Frederick County Public Schools is the best educational system possible. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. I'm not yet seeing uh, Mr. Mr. Johnson, Jason Johnson, join us, so we'll hope that he is able to do that soon. Um, Dr. Cuppet, if you'd like to make introductions on your end. Sure, absolutely. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Cuppet. I'm the Executive Director in the Curriculum Instruction and Innovation Department. And our team consists of all of the content experts from math to science to career and technology education and, and so forth. Uh, in addition, we also have the Early Childhood Education Department, uh, which includes our Judy Center programming uh, in our uh, department. So I see Mr. Johnson has joined us. Karen, you want to hop back over? Uh, Mr. Johnson, we're just doing introductions. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning. Uh, Jason, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? My pleasure. Jason Johnson here. Um, also, Mr. J. Ethan works fine. Jason, Mr. J. Ethan works fine. Um, I am a uh, educator of over 17 years. Um, originally with um, FCPS um, for about seven years of, of those years. Currently in Howard County. Um, I've done everything from in classroom instruction to um, state and national uh, instruction, uh, creating curriculum and uh, doing different designs. As you know, I'm a new like, member of the board this year, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, actually, I have a master's degree in curriculum instruction, and so this is kind of a passion area for me, so I'm very glad to be here. Awesome. So returning to our staff, uh, for the new board members, there are several people that serve on the committee in a permanent um, position, and then what happens then, a presenters come and go um, based on the topics that we have. So um, I'm going to go to Dr. Harris, uh, who's serving uh, for the AAE department. Good morning. Again, I'm Keith Harris, I'm Executive Director of Accelerating Achievement and Equity, or AAE um, for short. And under AAE, um, we serve the departments of special education, of English learners, of advanced academics, and the area of equity and cultural proficiency. So good morning, everyone. Also serving on the committee is Jen Bingman. So good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Bingman, Director of System Accountability and School Improvement. And I'm part of the SASA department, which is a school um, system administration, or sorry, system accountability and school administration. And so in my part of the department that I serve, we oversee state assessment, we oversee local assessment, intervention, um, in addition, all of our data platforms and data systems and our student information system, as well as the research requests that come in for our system. We also manage the surveys that we put out. Um, so we, we also take care of those. So that's a little bit about the team that I serve um, and what we do. It's good to be with you all. And then in the format of this committee, we also have um, directors from SAIL, for, which is the those directors that directly supervise our schools and so they rotate depending on the topics that we have so you throughout the course of the year you'll probably meet each of them uh, representing today is dr dan lippy good morning i'm dan lippy i'm the director of school management and charter schools um, my role in the school in sasa the school administration side is to liaison with all of the departments and the schools to try to make sure everything organizationally runs smooth as well as work with the curriculum side for the charter schools. And then the final uh, person that really helps the committee run uh, very smoothly is Linda Rain. She is the senior executive secretary that I have the pleasure of. She keeps me straight on a regular basis. So Linda, if you'd like to say hi. Hello everyone, welcome. We're glad to have you here and it's good to be with you. 
And Linda um, handles everything from the scheduling of the meetings to the minutes and all kinds of great stuff. So we, we appreciate her uh, support of the meeting. So that's it, Karen. And we'll introduce presenters as they come up. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, Linda, you have a tough job. Whew, don't envy you. Um, all right. So next up on the schedule then is public comment. And Dr. Cuppet, I believe you have several to read to us. Yeah, we do. So the um, make sure I'm not muted. OK, good. So the, the first one is from uh, Kareen McGarity. It says, Dear members of the Board of Education, I am a teacher and parent in Frederick County, and I also struggle every hour, every day with the educational crisis we are currently experiencing. I also recognize that my struggle isn't anywhere near that of my children and students. I'm writing this email to appeal to the Board of Education and specifically to the Curriculum Instruction Committee to consider the long-term effects of this crisis on our children and make adjustments to the current performance standards accordingly. My son has a computer, a strong Wi-Fi connection, two supportive parents, and a group of friends he can count on. Over the past year, I've watched my son go from being a consistent honor roll student who genuinely enjoyed school and learning to a freshman in high school in danger of failing 50% of his classes. This is not the effect of a lack of access to technology or lack of in-home support or a lack of educational background or English language knowledge. This is directly a result of the challenges created by an FCPS issued mandate during the pandemic. The challenges of attending all of his high school classes online. While some students have demonstrated the executive functioning and emotional stability to make the adjustment to online learning seamlessly, many have not. The system is penalizing these students unfairly. In high school, grades matter. They serve as motivators and demotivators. A GPA allows a student to participate in extracurricular activities or not. And grades ultimately play a huge role in the future of post-secondary educational choices available to these children. We absolutely cannot have the same level of performance expectations and use the same grading model that we used prior to the crisis. I'm requesting the committee consider adjustments. As a teacher at an international baccalaureate school in Montgomery County Public Schools, I'm expected to follow a revised grading policy adjusted for workload and performance expectations during the pandemic. Among other criteria, the adjusted policy for quarter two includes a bulleted list of significantly limits the amount of graded assignments in each class. Bullet two uses progress checks as diagnostic tools, not as a measure for marking for a marking period grade. Bullet three provides all students with a minimum of 50% grade for effort on an assignment. Parentheses. In other words, I am not permitted to give a student a grade two out of 10 because this would be less than 50% in parentheses. This has actually been in our grading policy pre-pandemic and demonstrates recognition of student effort. I am urging FCPS to more closely examine its guiding principles related to performance standards and grading before high school grades are final in January. And so many students, uh, oh, and so many students are penalized for their failure to adapt to this model of learning. Please help your students be more successful in the face of this unprecedented challenge. Thank you for your time. Corinne McGarity. The second public comment is from Elizabeth Joseph. Hello, I will not be available to make comment during the meeting. I do want to address the virtual education and grades falling. I was watching the other day and heard a story about this very topic. The number of failing grades has increased exponentially and girls have a 600% increase in failing grades. I know COVID forced a virtual learning situation, the teachers are doing all they can. My personal experiences have shown that some adults do great in a virtual classroom, but others do not. There are many reasons for this divide. Students shouldn't fail virtual classes if they are trying and need more help than they receive during the time constraints. Please look at the grading system that is in place. Good students are receiving much lower grades at this time. This will impact their ability to get into colleges. Please find a way to not penalize students because of the pandemic and necessary changes were implemented, but students never had, alert, had to learn in a virtual environment and many are struggling. In advance, thank you for conveying this message for me. Feel free to contact me via phone, easiest for me usually, or email, signed Beth. Those are the two that we have at this time. Thank you very much. 
And next on the agenda is um, the uh, minutes, approving the minutes. I know the other two board members weren't here. I saw no errors. Um, so unless anyone has any uh, corrections or additions, um, the minutes will stand. Okay, very good. Um, I think we'll jump over board member comments since everybody got to introduce themselves. I see Dr. Marco has uh, joined the meeting. Dr. Marco, would you mind introducing yourself? Good morning, all. Um, I'm Mike Marco. I'm the deputy superintendent. I'd like to uh, welcome both the Johnsons to our curriculum instruction meeting. You're in very good hands with Dr. Cuppet. I do apologize for coming late. That's because I was meeting with my boss. And I have to apologize, I need to leave early for another meeting, but welcome everyone and we look forward to the conversation. Very good, thank you. All right, so now we'll get into our agenda items and first up, uh, elementary and secondary science updates. Yeah, thank you. So we're, um, Colleen, if you wanna go ahead and start preparing to share, um, you can introduce yourself here in a second, but I will, um, first of all, um, introduce Dr. Horn. Um, Chris Horn is our elementary curriculum specialist, and Colleen Beal is our secondary curriculum specialist. And they're going to share um, elementary and secondary science updates. And for our new members to the committee, um, we work through updates on all of our curriculum areas uh, throughout the course of, it takes about a year and a half to get through them all. And what we try to do for the board is we try to bring the committee or we try to bring the curriculum updates in as most timely fashion as we can. Meaning that if there are certain things happening in that content area that we feel the board needs to be aware of, uh, we'll try to bring that to them. So obviously in all of our content areas, there's been adaptations as a result of being in the pandemic. And you're gonna hear that in both of these. Uh, and later in our CTE presentation, you're gonna hear about some recent changes. So I'm gonna turn it over and ask Chris uh, and then Colleen introduce themselves, and I believe Colleen's going to start the presentation. Okay, I'll introduce myself, and then I'll turn it over to Colleen, and then uh, she'll go first, and then I'll follow her with the elementary. My name's Chris Horn, and I am the curriculum specialist for elementary science, which uh, includes responsibilities for the curriculum for science for grades P through five, as well as I oversee the Earth and Space Science Lab and the Living Materials Center, which is housed at the Earth and Space Science Lab. And I've been in education for 36 years so far. I'm Colleen Beal. I'm the secondary science curriculum specialist, and I am responsible for the science programming for grades through six through 12, as well as the outdoor school. We're gonna go ahead and get started with secondary science. Our- can, um, Colleen, can you move yeah. over the presentation mode for that so it shows up a little Four. bit bigger? Yep. Perfect, thank you. So just to give you an overview, all of our, our core middle and high school courses are now fully aligned to the Maryland State Science Standards and um, so that's six, seven, eight for middle school science. And then we also have a full um, sequence of high school core courses that are also aligned to the Maryland State Science Standards. And those standards tie in with COMAR and the Maryland Integrated Science Assessment, which I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. We um, have added a new elective anatomy and physiology since we last met with the board with C and I. And anatomy and physiology, I'm proud to say, is now offered in all of our schools and is very popular. Our, um, our main work in supporting all of the different um, models, virtual, hybrid, is supported with our Schoology Blueprints. And over the summer, uh, our um, teacher teams were very busy uh, helping us develop student-facing blueprints in Schoology aligned with our curriculum. And we also have additional resources for our teachers on curriculum now. Our Schoology blueprints were really um, helping them with student-facing. 
and Outdoor School, I'm happy to announce, is uh, continuing in this virtual format. They are currently serving our sixth graders and they're spending about a week in all of our comprehensive middle schools. They are at Middletown uh, Middle this week and they have been, as uh, we've been moving through, they are, be, um, they are offering more live from the field broadcasts, which have been um, tremendously engaging and um, they have been growing in that. Wednesdays, they started out doing it with um, Wednesdays, talking about the watershed and now are incorporating even more. So we're really um, happy that we are still able to deliver a very robust environmental education in a virtual format. For secondary uh, science assessment, the Maryland Integrated Science Assessment assesses students in fifth grade, eighth grade, and then once in high school. The high school component has undergone a little change. Um, last year, the Maryland Board of Ed voted to change it from, it was assessing all the, um, the grade band of high school. So life science, earth science, and physical science, as well as the science and engineering practices and the cross-cutting concepts. The content, the science and engineering practices and the cross-cutting concepts are the three domains, the uh, three major components of the Maryland science standards. The old MISA for high school assessed all three contents and it is a graduation requirement. The Maryland Board of Ed decided that they were now going to go to life science content only. So for those of you who have been um, familiar with the system, back before MISA, we had HSA and we had a biology HSA. So it's more similar to that because now it's assessing just one course rather than multiple courses with a graduation requirement. That change will be going into effect because right now, for, um, to fulfill the graduation requirements, students need to, we call it, sit for the test. So they are taking the MISA, but there's not a cut score or a passing of it yet. Students in high school this year are um, taking the old version of the MISA as a graduation requirement as the state is developing the new version. So the new version, the life science content only MESA will be field tested next year. So our students again will be taking that as their graduation requirement, simply sitting for the test. And then they'll be collecting the information, the data and setting cut scores, et cetera. Our freshmen who will be entering high school the fall of 2022, so they will be the class of 2026, will be, um, have to pass the life science MESA for graduation. So I know that was a lot, but that was our main change in terms of high school graduation requirements in terms of science. The grade eight MESA is staying the same and it assesses the entire middle school band of Maryland State science standards. Different things that uh, Secondary Science Office has been doing to support our teachers. We have been offering office hours uh, weekly. We have um, several hours of office hours available every week. We're available to answer questions, offer assistance. Sometimes it's just a lot easier for our teachers to pop in, ask a tech question, ask a clarification. Uh, we have had over 80 teachers take advantage of our office hours in term one. And um, so far we have had over 35 teachers come by and see us for term two. In um, terms of professional learning opportunities, of course our main focus is, excuse me, to support our teachers uh, in teaching virtually. Uh, we have also been offering some optional book studies for MSDU credit um, after school. 
which have been popular too. Uh, Linda Mosser, the, techno the teacher specialist for secondary science, offered a book study on um, how students learn and, and how, uh, and then Laura Shear, our technology teacher specialist for science P12, just finished up, just wrapped up a book study on tech like a pirate, uh, which was um, very popular and was talking about technology, uh, using technology um, to teach, which was very timely. Uh, we, uh, the beginning of the semester, started just one hour monthly department chair check-ins. We have now morphed that into a screencast of um, information and uh, department chair focused office hours so they can drop in and ask any questions, things like that. Um, we just had our first department chair office hours uh, yesterday. And um, science fair is on schedule for March 20th, 2021. It will be our 40th annual Frederick County Science and Engineering Fair and our second annual virtual science fair. Uh, hopefully our second annual and final virtual science fair. Uh, but we are working on that. Um, we had a virtual fair last year and we had about two weeks to um, turn it from in-person to virtual and we had a really solid product. We are looking forward to producing uh, a little bit more enhanced this year, and I'm very excited to do that. Envirothon is still in the planning stages, but hope to offer that to this spring, and that is a high school competition. Chris? Okay, thanks, Colleen. Chris, so, this, Chris, just real quick before you sure, go in there, sure. um, I, I did want to go back and circle and just highlight a couple of things that Colleen has pointed out. Um, the idea, the irony did not escape us when we moved to an all virtual format and felt that we had to figure out what to do with our outdoor school. Um, I wanted to send a shout out to Brett Query, who leads that team. His entire team basically shifted their paradigm um, uh, rather rapidly to be able to do that. And you're going to hear similar kind of shifts when Dr. Horn talks about our ESSL uh, programming. So that was one thing I wanted to highlight. And I also wanted to thank our, our team, Colleen's team, uh, for the uh, amount of uh, work and wrestling that's going to occur over the next couple of years with the change in a major assessment like the MISA. Uh, that anytime there's a change in our major assessment program, it requires a lot of work and, and professional learning. Um, so I want to give uh, uh, proper props to them that that work is already underway. So, all right, Chris, thank you. Sure, thanks. Uh, so our format here is to, uh, I'll go through a, a couple slides, hit, hit a couple high, highlights, but then we want to really give you time to ask us questions if you have those questions and dig a little deeper into things. So. I'll finish up and then both Colleen and I will be available for that. Because uh, surely we're not gonna cover everything, but we just want to, to highlight what's been happening. First on my bulleted list here is that, that this uh, summer, we had our curriculum writers, first time ever in my, my career and anybody's career having a virtual curriculum writing. It was my 27th year for doing curriculum writing in my first uh, virtual and the teams uh, worked really hard and we got an amazing amount of work done. We were really pleased with that. And so one of the things that really I find as a source of pride for our curricular department is how over many decades, our teachers are at the center of building our curriculum. So uh, when teachers see these fa student facing materials in Schoology, they're seeing materials that, the, that uh, their colleagues, other teachers, um, have developed and then we've refined, but it's so great to have their input. And uh, so teachers are currently using those and we're continuing to develop those. We work with curriculum teams now who are doing double duty. They're writing curriculum and they're teaching and they're learning from what it's like to be uh, in a virtual environment and adapting how they, they develop curriculum for us. So we really find that to be 
super helpful and effective. And then on top of that, I have a bullet here for Curriculum Now resources, which are the resources we've already developed and teachers still have access to, of course. And we, we wanna just point that out because some teachers use the Schoology Blueprint courses just as, as developed because of the immense amount of pressure they're under and, and planning. So we want it to be as off the shelf ready as possible, but, but teachers who want to add things or, or look for additional resources, find those in curriculum now, and also in their, in their hands-on kits that they have in each of their classrooms. So some teachers have come in and taught from school, others are teaching from home, but they've uh, sometimes accessed those kits of materials and used those. And then to supplement that in the fall for the two life science units that kicked off the year in grades four and five, we built and distributed take home science kits to supplement those units, which was a tremendous task. A lot of people put a lot of effort into that. Um, when, I, when I envisioned this idea of building a kit for every student at grades four and five to, to send home for them to use, um, I didn't realize what 3,000 kits looked like. Uh, we're used to building kits, but so 3,000 kits at grade four and 3,000 at grade five became quite a monumental task and a lot of fun and a lot of, a lot of heartache, but uh, we've gotten great feedback from that to have students actually having things that they can do at home with those take-home kits. So it's our intention uh, to respond to the other life science units in grades K, one, two, and three here uh, in the spring, whether students are back in school partially, uh, whatever, whatever situation we face in the spring, we wanna make sure that uh, we'll have materials for them to take home if possible. So I wanted to highlight that. Our, our STEM leader program has been in place for a long time and uh, we have a representative from each school. I wanted to mention that because we're still continuing this program virtually this fall. We have a meeting tomorrow actually, and it's optional and it's after school, but uh, our STEM leaders are our are, are, are direct connect to schools. So we love having them and supporting them, giving them, sending them resources. Um, we like to provide some, some additional perks in, term, in the, the way of resources so that they can, they can try things out. Uh, so for instance, we're sending a, uh, a read aloud book for them to, to utilize with their students. And uh, we just have a lot of options to, to share and for them to sharpen one another. Uh, just as Colleen mentioned, um, during this, this season where things are not normal, we've been holding office hours several times a week for teachers to check in. They can always email and, and speak to us whenever they want to or reach out, but it's nice to ha just have those office hours where they can just pop in, say hi, say, you know, it's nice seeing a real person. And, um, and so we're, we're continuing to maintain that, that platform and will continue to do so. I mentioned MISA on here because um, our, our grade five students are, are the students who in the spring will take the MISA assessment um, and they're receiving all of their instruction virtually because all of the science at grade five is uh, built into the first semester. So we're also in preparation for MISA in the spring working with our curriculum writers to develop some um, practice and uh, review materials because the MISA is, includes uh, standards from grades three, four, and five curriculum. So we felt it was important to offer a resource for teachers and students to, um, to allow them additional opportunities to, to think about those, those science standards before the spring assessment. And then finally on this list, I have the science fair, which <laughs> last year ours is canceled. So I don't know what we're gonna do because uh, Colleen's on year 40 now. And so I guess that makes us year 39 or I don't know, but um, we're, we're uh, gonna meet with Colleen and, and try to envision an elementary science fair that is virtual. That's our plan right now. Um, we wanna have a contingency for either way, but but by uh, January, we're gonna have to make a decision about whether we're for sure virtual or if there's any opportunity for face-to-face, -face. but we think we'll end up being virtual for the, 
science fair in the spring. All right, Colleen, if you could just advance to that. Uh, so part of my responsibilities is to supervise the Earth and Space Science Lab, which Kevin mentioned. Um, we've had to shift what we do there quite significantly. So we have spent months and months developing uh, virtual field trips and posted those for teachers to utilize. Uh, throughout the spring, they uh, held Facebook Live events. And now in the fall, we have a weekly I Wonder. Today is on the, today at 11, um, they're presenting live on uh, the winter circle from our uh, planetarium, which is gonna be a cool episode uh, so we've tried to keep things, um, even in the virtual world, exciting and alive for them. In addition to all those materials that we uh, provide uh, with the virtual events, we also give um, a platform where there's additional activities and resources for teachers and students to access. And uh, just by way of updating you on things happening at the Earth and Space Science Lab, in addition to our new way of doing doing the world virtually. Um, after uh, we've been open for 11 years at the new facility and our digital projector was had a lifespan of about seven to 10 years. So we're really thankful to have installed this fall a new digital projector because the old one was failing. And uh, so there's been uh, intense training to use that new resource. And on top of that, we've received these amazing displays from the Maryland Science Center, which we're having updated. And so when we finally get to open our doors to students again, it's going to be a whole new ESSL. So we're kind of excited. We've got new displays, a new digital projector system. And, um, and I also just bulleted because uh, we're, we're taking the opportunity to do some work in our Arboretum. Um, it's, very, um, it's, it's just one more facet of our program. But a, but a kind of a hidden gem back in the corner of our, of our campus there at, at uh, Lincoln Elementary. And um, we're gonna continue to do some maintenance there. And then we hope to host a big outdoor event this coming summer. Um, we're gonna work with the Frederick County Public Library System and hold a, a really cool event there. So I talked a mile a minute, threw a lot of things out. Colleen went through, it's your turn ask us questions, um, we're, we're here to answer whatever things you have to ask. Very good, thank you. Um, Ms. Johnson, do you have any questions? No, I think um, I understood everything that was presented. I don't know what I don't know, so. <laughs> That is fine. I'm sure they don't mind that at all. And you'll get used to it and you'll come up with questions later, I know. Um, Thanks for everybody's hard work. It sounds exciting. And Mr. Johnson, how about you? Hi, I did have a, a few small questions. Uh, first, I want to thank um, uh, Chris and Colleen for, for presenting and thank you for all the work you do. Um, I'm actually very acquainted with it and I, <laughs> and I know it's, it's actually excellent work. Um, so I just want to have a couple questions for uh, clarification I wanted to ask. Um, for the curriculum that they're making um, going forward for virtual, um, I know we're, the, the big hot button is like, you know, the preparation for eventual hybrid one day when it's, when, when it's um, considered safe to go, go forward. Um, are we making uh, content for the concurrent teacher? Um, I, I really rather it not be the case for teachers, but it's, 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 right now it's on the table. So when we're making content, is there something made for the teacher to, you know, a, a, the same vein, same content, but I have something for the kids who are here with me and something for the kids asynchronous to do online. So I'm not really so stressed doing both at the same time. Would that, that, that be considered? I, I can just give a simple yes, but I, I, I'm going to defer to Dr. Cuppet because yeah. uh, he spent <clears throat> all of our time on this issue, so I'll let him respond. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think one of the biggest areas of concern that teachers have right now is the idea behind how do I do concurrent? How do I teach kids who are with me at the same time that they're at home, and, and how do I manage that? So what we've asked the department to do, and all of our folks here are, are part of that, is to be, begin cap conceptualizing a couple of things. One, 
what are the best times and best purposes to use concurrent teaching? Because the, the MSD state requirement is what it is. There has to be this on average of 3.5 hours. I'm sure you're aware of that. And so um, things like direct instruction, if we're going to do an immediate direct instruction and students at home could tune into that as well as the students at school, uh, we're giving uh, professional learning in the month of January that shows teachers how to configure their classroom to be able to do that. And so things like direct instruction would be important to do and concurrent. And then we're and then we're asking teachers and providing resources to add, to then ask a very important question. What is something students could do at home that's independent, right, related to the class instruction, which isn't very different than having a group of students go to the back of the classroom in a traditional classroom and work on something independently mm -hmm. while I now focus on the students who are in front of me. And we're giving teachers um, advice and guidance around what are those high leverage strategies of what we want to do when students are there, when we have them physically in front of us, and how is that different than, than in the virtual space? So I'll just take the idea behind science. There are certain things in science that science teachers can do when kids are in front of them. And so how do they leverage that time while students at our home are working on something independently. And then at the end of that instructional block, how do I bring everybody back together to make sure they're on the same page and that they can move forward? So the idea behind good and good high quality independent work and good high quality work that we do when we have our students in front of us are the two biggest questions that my teams are now developing resources around. So that's the idea about what we're trying to do. Um, to be able to support teachers if they have concurrent responsibilities, which, which they will. Okay, great. Thank you. And I had a couple other questions uh, really quick. Um, just I wanted to, um, I'll, I'll say them out really, really, really fast. Uh, so the next one was uh, for the STEM leaders, are they, um, I wanted to know, are they working on integration with other classes? Are they working on um, preparation for the MISA for their, for their schools? What's some of, uh, give me a quick shot of, of, of their highlight move right now. I'll talk about the elementary. Uh, the elementary STEM leader is a classroom teacher. And so a classroom teacher uh, by definition is a, is a generalist, teaches all the different contents. And so they, they come to the meetings, they're a representative, but they're also a classroom teacher for language arts, mathematics, okay. science, STEM. And so we try to give them resources, access, first access to materials that we've developed that can be utilized in with integration as much as possible. Um, but they are, are definitely not exclusively STEM leaders and science teachers. They're, they're generalists. And so we're, we're just appreciative to have their voice and their, um, their expertise back at the school they they host events at the school often a stem event or a science fair things like that okay so i'll just I want to look on, on, on that on that role as, as, as it going forward mm -hmm. and then um just had two more questions one is the misa let me give them virtually uh, next year do we know that or not no okay just i was just, i was just curious i had a meeting earlier this morning about the ap exam they were debating the same thing so um, we, if you find out something, please let us know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. And the last question was, I'm going to ask, um, how's Drupal? Drupal as well. No, Drupal no. is, uh, with, with the possible exception of missing everyone. Yeah. So uh, I will just tell you that in the spring, uh, when when we had the shutdown, we had a an event, a virtual event. Uh, and the first one we focused on was Drupal the Iguana. And we've had 6,000 views for that particular nice. event. And then in the summer, we held another uh, Drupal-focused virtual event where it was his birthday. And uh, let's see, Drupal's birthday, 2,180 uh, views. So Drupal's more popular than most everybody I know, including my entire staff. <laughs> so thanks for asking about Drupal. He'll be glad you did. Drupal is an iguana. And he's our, our uh, designated mascot at the Earth and Space Science Lab. Thanks. That was it? Very good. I love that last question. Yes, uh, I was, and I'm glad you told who Drupal was because only people who have been there have seen Drupal wandering around. So, um, of course, I have a few questions. Um, for Colleen, the anatomy and physiology elective, what grade typically are you seeing that? Um, 
students are taking that? Okay. We have designed it as a fourth course elective. So we're having mostly juniors and seniors take that. So after they've taken all of their graduation requirements and the um, MSSS aligned courses, then they have more opportunities. Cause we just wanted it, we wanted to have more courses available for kids to take as much science as they would like and can fit in their schedule. Very good, very good. Yes, that's an enjoyable course. And I hear um, admissions to med school are way up with the pandemic. Uh, everybody wants to be Dr. Fauci now. Um, next, <laughs> next question I had. Um, so, you know, a lot of times as board members, we ask questions from a personal perspective. Um, my father's a retired nuclear physicist. And so I grew up not liking logic, but now, you know, it's, it's there with me. But when I got to college, I found out I was really bad at life sciences. And, um, and, and then I took astronomy and I got an A and I won't even talk about my grades in zoology and botany. Um, so I'm just wondering why the focus on life science when you know each different Earth, life, uh, and um, physics are very different branches of science. And so the focus on life science, I'm just wondering if that doesn't leave other kids out like it would have left me out. Uh, that's a really good question. And uh, the NGSS, the Next Generation Science Standards, which is what the Maryland State Science Standards are based on, uh, took that into account. And they are very well rounded, the standards, because it's earth science, life science, and physical science. So our courses are aligned to that. And the sequence that students um, take um, covers all three. So our students are being educated in all, in all three, but only tested on the life science. Does that help clarify? It, it does, but I've just, again, the why, why just the test on life science? Why, and maybe that's better for kids, but it seems like it, it takes out some of the balance like the, the fifth grade and eighth grade Mises do. Yeah, it was a decision by the state to, um, to, just, to focus on the life science. And which leads me just to another question that came to mind. One of the reasons I didn't particularly like zoology and bi um, biology was the um, cutting up little creatures. So to, to students, I was way ahead of my time when I, I abstained from doing that and got an F, but um, do students have to um, cut things apart? <laughs> no, if, uh, if dissection is offered, uh, we also always offer an alternative to dissection with no penalty to the student. And we never surprise the students either. So we always let them know if dissection is coming up and they have a chance to opt out with no penalty. Again, I was just way ahead of my time. I should have been in school now. Thank you very much. And just a couple of questions. Oh, um, so Dr. Horn, when are you looking to give the MISA, or I guess that would be for either, um, but in elementary, when is the MISA uh, slated to happen? It's in the spring. Colleen, I, I don't have the date in front of me. Do you know the date? I know it's March. March. Um, well, I can look it up real quick. It's, and I just kind of was looking for a month. So, because when we say spring, that's pretty wide. So, okay, March. So that is coming up. Um, and this is not as much a question as just a suggestion, Dr. Horn. Um, the county PTA had to do a virtual reflections program last year. And so that was, you know, a lot of art, literature, things like that. And so you might tap into the county PTA for some suggestions. Of course, you have a great resource in this BL with already having done it. But they, they also went through that kind of at the last minute and were able to throw a very nice production together. So... Very nice, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that's that's all I had, so I appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Yeah, so um, Ms. Yoho, the, according to the, the document I have in front of me here, the MISA will be, um, looks like March 8th through March 19th. So it's 
Hate to say it, but it feels like it's coming right around the corner. Well, it is. They better decide pretty quick. So you all, I mean, well, anyway, of course, that's, uh, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But yeah, that, that's why I wonder if it was April or, you know, whatever, they had a little more time. They better get their some selves going. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I think we can move on, Dr. Cuppet. All right. Well, um, so our next presentation is around career and technical education, which, by the way, we, we call it a career and technology education for a long time. But the state has changed its mind, I think, maybe from some federal yeah. persuasion. So career and technical education. Um, so I'll have um, Dr. Pearl and Mr. McGacky introduce themselves. Good morning. Uh, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I am uh, Christine Pearl. I'm the supervisor of career and technology education. And some of the roles that I do are related to um, <clears throat> compliance. I am the liaison to MSDE. As you're going to hear about today, there are a lot of, there's a lot of legislation uh, surrounding CTE. So I ensure the compliance. I oversee the grants for our department. Um, and I focus on developing the new programs of study. Anytime we're updating or moving to a new program of study, there's a, a complex process that we go through. So I work on that. Um, I also coordinate the partnerships because partnerships are a very important part of career and technology education through our program advisory councils, our local advisory councils. We work closely with workforce services and the Frederick County Office of Economic Development. So um, that is another component of what I what I oversee. And then I also directly oversee the programs at the Career and Tech Center, as well as work-based learning. So Norm does the rest. So I'm gonna pass it off to him on that. Hi, how's uh, everybody doing? I'm Norm McGacky. I'm the coordinator for Career and Technology Education. And I do that with a lot of help from our teacher specialist, Corbin Shoemaker. Also, we sort of, what, what we do uh, besides Christine is we work with the career technology education at the high schools and also at the middle schools. So I oversee like computer science, uh, engineering, uh, the business pathways, uh, family consumer science, our, our, our child development at the high school. But at the middle school, we have family consumer science courses. We have uh, tech ed courses along with a computer science course at the middle school and also some STEM courses such as our Learn, Apply, and Build 21st Century Skills and our Invention and Innovation course. So we deal with a lot of the teachers uh, in the middle and the high school, but Christine also helps out in ag. She might, you know, we sort of work as a team where, where we can't all do it uh, individually. So we, we sort of jump in and uh, whoever's available to, to put out the fire, um, that's who takes it on. So that's it. All right. Well, I thank you both for being here. And we have a lot of important updates here. So I'm going to turn it over to, I assume, Dr. Pearl, you'll start. And if you can just move to presentation mode so it shows up a little yes. bit busier, that'd be awesome. Yes. And I thought I had done that. So give me one second. You know what? I have two slideshows up. Let me give me one second. Here we go. Now I have the right one. Yeah, you did. We just lost your presentation. So you did. Okay, one second. So stop sharing on that. Stop and come back in. Okay. Okay, I had two different ones up, and that was what was creating the uh, confusion. Okay. You got it. Yep. Here it comes. Okay yep. Do. Ready to go. Thanks, Christine. <laughs> Okay, so let me get to the next slide. Okay, technical difficulties, even though we practice. There we go. Okay, so because uh, two of you are new to our board, we wanted to just give a brief overview first of what is CTE. Oftentimes people have a tendency to think that career and technology education is only the center. And in fact, as Nora mentioned, we have eight different courses that we offer in our middle school and 16 program of studies in our comprehensive high schools, as well as 
23 program of studies at the Career and Tech Center. Now, when we say program of studies, we're not talking about individual courses. We are talking about a series of three to four courses that are sequential, that um, gain in complexity as students uh, move along through the pathway and ultimately end in industry certification and or college credit. So as you're going to hear, there's been a lot of legislative changes in the past two years that have taken a look at how we can improve CTE. And a lot of folks, uh, again, from workforce services, from the Department of Labor, the Department of Commerce, CTE folks, um, industry partners in particular have weighed in. And the real, the primary focus now is that we are all working together. We have a shared purpose towards creating a foundation for an educated and a skilled workforce. So, of course, just like our colleagues in science presented, um, we have been extremely focused for the past nine months on goal one, priority one, which is supporting our teachers. And as you get to know Norm, you will find out that he is such an enthusiastic person. He's almost like the Pied Piper of CTE. Um, and so he does just a wonderful job of encouraging our teachers to do more, to continue to improve. And so, you know, we have to give him credit where credit is deserved. He has been amazing with uh, supporting our teachers with blueprint courses. And we really both have extensive collaboration with our teachers. We, um, in fact, I got two requests just this week from two contents and said, we haven't met in a couple of weeks. Can we meet? They're, they're reaching out to us because we meet as content, um, you know, whether it's child development or our work-based learning teachers or our middle school tech ed teachers. When we meet, we meet in our small groups. So we have a lot of meetings with them, but they are asking for more because they love being able to communicate with one another, to get ideas, and also to, um, to just share in their, their struggles that they're having as well as their joys. Um, one of the things that our uh, teacher specialist for technology has been very instrumental in is working with DTI to get the software access so that students with Chromebooks at home can access now AutoCAD, uh, Adobe, Microsoft Office. And that has been a uh, longtime project and we are really excited to say that it has been very successful. And we have to thank, um, again, DTI, Corbin Shoemaker, our teacher specialist, and the incredible um, work of all of our teachers that have just embraced change so that they can do the best for their students. Yeah, Christine, I would like to add the um, highlighting what the, and DTI of course stands for Department of Technology Infrastructure. That's Mr. Gardner and his crew over there. Um, not only did they do a, a, a huge lift in virtualizing the software so that we could do things with students, you know, could do things at home on their, on their computers that they hadn't been able to before, uh, but all of the other work that went into the move to virtual. Um, and um, Corbin Shoemaker and his role of connecting with them has been, this was a huge lift done in a short period of time. And I, I did want to give a shout out to all of those players. And he actually, I, I'm also going to say, he actually uh, went to one of our last MSDE director meetings and shared how he went about this process because it's something that other counties have um, are behind us on. So we were really a leader in getting that rolling. Um, community partnerships, as I mentioned, that's a big component of CTE. When we change a program of study or add a new one, we don't do it in isolation. We, we look at data. We look at local workforce data. We talk to our local industry folks. We look at their data and their need and then make the decisions on what is best for Frederick County students. Um, our advisory partners, again, I'm gonna brag because Frederick County is so amazing, but MSDE frequently says we are the model for our local advisory councils. And they frequently have folks join us from other counties. Uh, at our last meeting, Anne Arundel County joined us. So um, 
again, Frederick is a wonderful, wonderful place to live and work because of the involvement of our community. But then today I'm primarily going to focus on the state and federal compliance that has come about um, again, as a result of uh, several uh, pieces of legislation. So let's jump right into that. Um, if you can see all of the different manuals on this slide. Those are just a few of the manuals that have been put out by MSDE over this past year in related, um, all related to the regulations, significant regulations that started in 2018 um, surrounding CTE. So the federal Perkins Law, and um, which is um, actually the Strengthening Career and Technology Education for the 21st Century, but we commonly refer to it as Perkins 5. So Perkins was updated um, as a result of that. We've been working very carefully on our methods of administration requirements, which essentially are taking a good hard look at every way that we um, that we provide opportunities for students to make sure that they're equitable through our recruiting practices, through our marketing materials, through our instructional resources, ensuring that, that all students have an equitable opportunity to participate and be successful in CTE. Um, of course, the Every Student Succeeds Act has provisions for career and technology education, the More Job for Marylanders Act, the Kerwin Commission, and I didn't put on the slide, but also the MSTE graduation requirements task force. Um, so all of those combined change the direction for CTE, hence a lot of the new um, documentation. And I'm gonna explain a lot of new ways that we are looking at CTE. The major law that is impacting us is that 45% of all high school students will be required to complete a CTE program of study, earn an industry recognized credential at the concentrator level or complete a registered apprenticeship um, or another apprenticeship by 2025. Now I will share that we are right now at 21%. So we know we have a heavy lift. So, um, and, and to be honest, when you look at the state data, it's the larger school systems that have a greater gain um, that, that we need to accomplish. The smaller school systems have more students that are focused directly on CTE. So we have some strategies in place and I'm going to share some of those in a minute. But these are also some of the COMAR regulations that are currently being discussed. In fact, at um, Monday's state MSDE meeting, they discussed three of these related to graduation requirements, CTE, um, and programs in tech ed. And those changes will be discussed again at the MSDE January meeting. And we anticipate that those changes will be put into place for not next year's students, but the year after. So back to the strategies for more jobs for Marylanders. These are some of the things that we are currently implementing to increase our data. One of the, one of the main focuses is that we are retraining our stakeholders. We've recently met with principals, with counselors, with all of our CTE teachers, and we're asking them to retrain their mindset that CTE is not a series of electives, it's a program of study. We don't want a piece of the pie, we want students to take the whole pie because that way they are trained for an opportunity for their future. So that's number one, marketing. We are continuing to add industry certifications and provide student supports in programs of study that didn't previously have them. And I don't have this on the slide, but we have also, over the last two or three years, we have added 19 dual enrollment opportunities for students in CTE. Um, we are reviewing now equitable access. We're trying to eliminate any barriers that we find, again, so that more students have opportunity to access our programs. We're reviewing, for instance, our policy of how we accept students at CTC, as well as um, just all other aspects of CTE. We are enhancing our youth apprenticeship program as well as our career research and development program, which was formerly a work study, as well as internships. Because again, that is a component of more jobs for Marylanders 
And we do need to make sure that we are increasing opportunity access uh, for our students. Uh, Norm and I are going to be seeing you all this afternoon because we're coming to you to talk also about um, an innovation grant that we recently earned. And the intent of that innovation grant is to create access for capstone courses through online options. So again, increasing access for students, um, very important to us because in the smaller schools, it's sometimes difficult to offer all of the courses involved in a program of study just because of scheduling. So we hope that this will increase opportunities. And then lastly, uh, with the recent um, announcement that several of our programs of study could be moved from four courses to three, we are refining that curriculum and putting that in place uh, for three of our programs of study. So um, let's take a look at those. The first one is agriculture. And we have three different pathways within agriculture. We have a pre-vet pathway, horticulture, and mechanics. Previously, those courses had four courses, or those programs had four courses. We have moved it with the uh, approval of MSDE and our superintendent. And so now students only have to complete three to be a completer. Now they can still complete the fourth and we have that as additional opportunities. We also want to encourage students to participate in internships or work-based learning experiences. But we know um, based on previous experience, we had a lot of students that were able to get to concentrator level previously to the third course. In cases of these programs of study, hundreds, but that number dwindled significantly when it got to the fourth course. We know that through this revision, we will increase our numbers. And as was explained to us from MSDE, from Tierra Booker Dwyer, our associate superintendent, who oversees college and career readiness, what this revision did was it, it minimized redundancy. It aligned to national CTE, where all other states um, only require three courses and it increased opportunities for, or to expand opportunities in CTE. Um, Norm, who oversees Business Pathways, is going to explain a little bit about this one. Uh, what we've done here is we are actually changing some names of our business courses. We figured while we're aligning to the state and the three courses they had, why not align our curriculum to the states and actually, they just had a firm spend $125,000 to write this new curriculum. But they wrote it in the spring of 2020. That's when they finished, before the pandemic. So one of the things with the innovation grant is we are taking the foundation that they have provided. And I've been working with Kent Soffer right from uh, the part Maryland's Department of Education. And he provided me all their resources. And now my team, we're taking it and we're making it and turning it into a, a curriculum that can be taught almost like what you said, Mr. J, in a virtual environment, in a hybrid environment, online, providing more access to students. That's what we're doing with this grant. So we're like, we're not going to take our courses and do that. Let's take theirs while we're moving in this direction. So the four we're focused on is the principles of business management, entrepreneurship, principles of finance and accounting. And then once a student has those two, they can choose uh, their third course to be a completer, either advanced business management. Maybe they want to focus on accounting. Principles of marketing is a new course that we're, we'll be adding. And we feel a lot of students will really be interested in this marketing. Um, and we didn't have that before. Or will they continue down through our office systems management, which is replacing our Microsoft Office certification? Because after speaking with Kent, and I think everybody realizes, uh, someone coming into an, a business administrative service position, five years ago, if you knew Word and you knew PowerPoint and Excel, you were pretty good. But times have changed. Uh, there's a lot more platforms out there, just as Miss Johnson came on and struggled a little bit with Google Meet. You know, I mean, but once you learn one platform really well, then we know that those students or those uh, are going to be 
you know, we're trying to get them prepared for multiple platforms. So that's what that office systems management one and two will do. It's a little bit broader than just Microsoft Office. So, um, and the state has said that, and we sort of want to go with those guidelines. So we're like, while we're making the guidelines from three to, or four to three, let's go. And this is going to provide us opportunity to collaborate with more schools across the state, more counties are going to adopt this. And that's, that's going to help also. Um, the more collaboration we have, the better off we'll be. So that's why we've made that, that leap, taking that leap, I guess. I do want to share as well that, that in his research, Norm is also working with FCC. He's working with um, James Hatch and remind me who the other person is, Norm. Oh, Karen Wilson, who is who is program manager of business ed. So we are ensuring that we are aligning to their programs of study as well. Um, again, because we want to continue to offer dual enrollment opportunities and we have what's called articulation agreements with yeah. uh, the colleges where students can get credit by taking FCPS courses that align to FCC courses, they can get articulated credit. Now, I want to give you an example um, while we're talking about business ed, but our Cisco networking program, our students in that program currently have the opportunity to take dual enrollment in um, CMIS 120, 121, 290, and 292. Now, please don't ask me what they are. Um, and they end with comp, TIA A plus as well as CCNA. So what we found is actually several of our instructors for Cisco are also adjuncts at FCC. They found a perfect alignment. And so students have the opportunity to take dual enrollment or if they for some reason are not eligible for dual enrollment because they aren't CCR yet, then they are still able to earn articulated credit. So we're really excited about these increased opportunities. And again, remember, our focus for a program is ending in either an industry certification and or college credit. So where possible, we are offering that op both options um, to our students in our as we further refine our programs of study. And, and one other person we're working with is Mike Watson, Principal Watson from the virtual school. Because while we're doing this, we're working with him to make sure our courses align with what he's offering. And once again, if it's not accessible by a student, we want them to be able to say, oh, I can just take it at the virtual school. And we think all that will add to more of our completer. So we all want to be on the same page. So it's been great working with him, too. So. Okay. And I and before you move on, I did want to highlight just in the, to circle back to the Microsoft Office that we've traditionally done here, uh, the idea that that students are going to have to know multiple platforms is becoming more and more real. Um, I you know I I serve in an adjunct role in in higher education, and I've and between Schoology and two colleges I work for, I've had to learn three different learning management systems. Ms. Johnson, you were mentioning when you came on prior to the meeting, this is your fourth. I think video conferencing platform that you've had to learn. So this idea of being platform flexible is really important. So I'm glad that we're making some of these improvements to build the skill set for our students. So thank you, Christine and Norm. Okay, I've, I accidentally hit out of it, but I have one more or two more slides to share. One second. Here we go. Okay, so the last program of study that we decreased to three credits uh, was career research and development. And um, this was our old work study. And with the change to the COMAR requirements for career development, we're really focusing on providing a guided experience for our work-based learning students. It's not the intent, get them out the door and get them into a job. The intent is to prepare them for a career. So we are um, asking all students next year to concurrently 
take the advanced career preparation course, which again is a guided experience with our work-based learning coordinators. And then we're building so that the following year, we will begin identifying those students who would benefit from this program of study to in 10th or 11th grade to take the intro to career research and development program. So um, again, we know that it will be a benefit to our students to have that guided experience as they navigate the workforce. Um, it's really fun when we meet with our work-based learning coordinators sometimes to hear um, the successes that our students are having in the workplace, but also the misconceptions that our students sometimes have. Um, and sometimes they're almost comical to us as adults that for perhaps a student, uh, this is a real story, a student was sick and so they, the next day they came to their job and they brought them a note from their parents. They didn't know you had to call the employer and say, you know, I'm not gonna be there today. So there are just so many things that our students, you know, we can help them navigate the work, uh, the workplace by including an educational experience along with the program. So with that, um, we've given you a crash course in CTE and we have much more to share um, another time, but we're open for any questions you may have. Uh, Mr. Johnson, if you'd like to begin, if you have any questions. Yes, I do. Thank you. But I just want to start by saying um, to Christine and uh, Norm, thank you so much for, for, for what you do. Um, I just had a meeting yesterday with United Way, and I want to let you know that um, the, the kids you are preparing, um, you're, you're saving their lives because CTE, um, I actually am a CTE educator at the current time. Um, it is, we need necessary job skills um, to keep our kids um, functional in this world. And CTE skills really help make you what I, I like to call now COVID proof. And you want to be able to, um, to have functional skills to survive in this world. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, I also have a strong passion. Today was like for me, it was like a candy store because science and CTE are like you know those are my those are my my educational love. So I'm just having a fun. I'm having fun today. So um, I have some questions. Um, feel free to, to tell me, Mr. J. I'll get back to you because I've got a lot. I might email some of these, but I want to get a couple off that I wanted to ask. Um, and so I wanted to ask, what is our approach and what is our current um, relationship with uh, dis technology that, that's just disruptive? Um, of recent industry, Google and Apple, and a lot of um, higher up Silicon companies have said, like, you know what? We're going to go away from being so mandated on the college degree. And so we even started with the um, Google certification courses where they have data analysis, they have security. And once you take the course, they'll actually help you get a job. And this is a very, very rich program to where if we sponsored our students in this program, they would keep, take this course and then Google would help them find jobs after the fact. So some of our kids are not going to be college bound, are not able to be college bound. They could be actually really well high wage earners, you know, learn these skills. So what is our approach in our, in our relationship with um, technology that's going to be disrupt, disrupt, a kind of break the cycle? It's, it's going to disrupt the usual to college pipeline. Norm, do you want to take that? I, I can I could take that. We're, we're always pushing. The problem we have is, you know, our go-to is MSDE, right? So we sort of can't just make up stuff. So... Uh, you know, which I would like to, you know, because I, I worked in the business world and I'm like, this is really, you know, what we should be doing. But one of the things that uh, Dr. Kupp had just talked about, we talked about office systems management. Mm -hmm. The only certification we had in there was Moss. So we've actually reached out to MSDE and said, hey, can you give us maybe a Google certification? Can mm -hmm. we do some different certifications? So they're looking, I guess, Florida and Texas as like the first ones to actually be looking into this. And so we're, that's what we want to do. We want more, we want to provide more choice for the mm -hmm. students. So, uh, you know, we're always doing that, but that's why we, we're even changing that name from Microsoft Office Certification class to Office Systems Management. Right. It gives us more flexibility in what we can put in our curriculum. Okay, you know? great. So, so uh, we're, we're trying, but you know, uh, but we're we're pretty good friends with MSDE. They like us. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. I didn't know that there, there was a, a kind of cap on what, what what you were able to a lot of kids to uh, tap into. So I, yeah. I, I, my, my part, I have advocacy on my part to help help get that going. Um, There's actually a, what's called the MSDE Blue Book, which are approved programs of study, and mm -hmm. we have to fall within the requirements of those uh, programs of study. Thank you for the Blue Book. I'll look at that. 
Uh, I have a lot here. I have emails some of these, but I have another question I wanted to ask about um, about two more I'll ask. Um, and one I wanted to ask about the um, usually in science, you'll have uh, curricular teams meeting and recommending kids for courses and kind of a um, there's a grooming of pipeline with um, CTE. Uh, what is our current and plans for future from elementary? to high school pipeline because what happens is these skills are like reading they now have to be like breathing you have to you really have to be able to be flexible beyond just the usual you know administrative like paperwork skills so i'm really looking to see that we grab our kids and let them know that, hey i'm not going to cause i'm going to be a lawyer well it's still good to have this skill because you could work during the summertime and, and make great money for a lawyer and not and not, not be a waitress with these skills while you're going to be a lawyer. So let them know it's, it's not like, you know, not for me. And so that'll help drive our, our numbers as well. But what are we currently doing in that pipeline? So we partner with a number of organizations for summer programs mm -hmm. that allow our students at the elementary school level to participate in like career camps. Some of our teachers, um, again, through workforce services and numerous different grants, um, our teachers are able to come in and and kind of capture the young imagination and let them be aware of the programs of study that we offer. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's one way. Norm, um, who oversees our middle school, works very closely with our STEM folks at the elementary school level. Do you want to talk about some of those partnerships, Norm? Yeah, what, what we've been doing, uh, Jay, is in the last three or four years, I would say really making it an effort to push computational thinking and computer science down from the high school level. We started first with the middle school level because that's a skill that we feel every student should have, you know, that, that computational thinking. We've actually got our high school and middle school teachers involved in like coding clubs mm -hmm. and like, um, and working, even from the middle school, like going down to the high school, and, and I've been working with Erin Landsman. She's in charge of she's okay. she's a STEM. Uh, she works with uh, yeah, Chris and Colley. Yeah, so you know, Erin and I, even though we're not in the same department, we're actually on a uh, team um, with some other people in in the district, and we've been sort of collaborating. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing with Computer Science Month this month, what we've, what we've changed this year and how we've done things like that. But we feel that there are these skills that all students should have regardless of what their career is. You know, and that, that goes with financial literacy. We've made a lot of gains on that within the last uh, three or four years. And we've done some things at the high school level and middle school. So um, there are certain skills that we feel like every student should have. And we, we're trying. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Norm really was uh, successful in making Hour of Code. Now let's see, now he has a whole computer science month, but mm -hmm. Hour of Code several years ago, that was pushed elementary all the way up. Mm -hmm. And um, that's been very successful as well. But he is coming back to talk to you all this evening or this afternoon mm -hmm. about computer science. So he'll be able to get into more detail then. Great. And then I had my, my last question just um, um, currently, this is yes or no, you can throw it out there. Do we currently have any course, these courses? Are they, are they weighted? A lot of times kids will take a course for the like, oh, if it's weighted, oh yeah, I, I'll take this weighted and now kind of be an enticer. And do we have that with these courses? Yes, several years ago, we, we really took a hard look at many of our courses at the Career and Tech Center, as well as the comprehensive high schools. And kind of our thought was, if we're able to give articulated credit for a course, then that's college level work. And so then that should be weighted. Yeah. And so um, many of our capstone courses are weighted in addition to several of the programs like the Project Lead the Way Biomedical and the Project Lead the Way Engineering. Um, Cisco is all weighted. So you know we we continue to go through the evaluation process and ensure that Opportunities in CTE for weighted courses are equitable with with all other contents. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm a big cheerleader over here, so if you have any questions or anybody I can help, let me know. Thank you so much for sharing both of you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. Johnson, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, actually, I actually have a few uh, as well. I know there's a couple that I could go right to James or Karen with because they're in my department. So, um, 
I uh, also appreciate all the hard work that you all do and um, probably 15, maybe even closer to 20 years ago, I did a lot more work in collaboration with the uh, CTC. Um, one question I have is, is any plans for expansion? Because at FCC, we seem to build building after building after building after building. And when you drive by the CTC, it looks the exact same way it, it does did in 1997 when I first started teaching in FCC. So can you, can someone just address that for me? Because I'm just wondering. We would love to expand. And that's been a discussion that's come up many times, but unfortunately funding has not um, enabled that to go forward. So I don't know if, if Dr. Cuppet wants to address yeah. that. So I think, um, you know, given the opportunity to expand, our staff would have a lot of ideas about um, programs. It, it has been a conversation that the boards had repeatedly. Um, there was some exploration uh, when the Lincoln A building came up. There was some conversation around that. Uh, quite frankly, it's an issue that the board struggles with every time that it does come up, uh, so, you know, because that capital uh, expansion is the the challenge. Um, but considering that, I, I, I will I do want the board to, to understand that the staff has done an excellent job of looking at existing programs and raising them to the level of those, you know, kind of certifications or credentials, as well as adding programs back in at our comprehensive high school. So if we didn't have space, for instance, at the CTC, could we actually locate a program like that? So the biomedical is one of the best examples. Had that program at CTC, we've added it over at um, the uh, at Tuscarora. About, yeah. And then we actually did some uh, configuration at the CTC in the last two years where we took a space from a program that uh, was eliminated because of lack of enrollment and we renovated that space and to be able to move that space inside and then created a new program out in the, the previous location. So we're maximizing the space that we have while we're doing this program analysis and trying to get uh, the programs that are as forward thinking as possible. But uh, um, we've also had some ongoing discussions with FCC about co-located spaces. It's just, you know, there has to be that that combination of space availability and the funding to increase programs, because anytime you add a program, you most likely are adding staffing. And so those are costs that um, have to be accounted for. So um, we're open to the conversation, that's for sure. Okay. That was one question. Um, on your virtual desktops, how, how are you doing that for your higher end software? Did, does anyone know? Is that a question I should ask to DTI? I wish Corbin was here, but is that something you could answer, Norm? No, I just know that the kids are actually VPNing in, you know, and they, they basically have a server for our students. Okay. Um, and so, and, and we roster those certain students are, are, are available to that. So um, it, it seems to be successful. You know, they, they took some grant money and they were able to do that. And so I think that's money very well spent. And mm -hmm. it, it could be even used after the pandemic. That's the nice thing. A lot of these tools, yeah, it's, it's utilized now, but now, we could use it after, you know, mm -hmm. which I think it's, that's money really well spent. And that was funded through CARES. Okay. Yeah, I saw that in, in reading somewhere along the line. Um, and I guess along the same vein, in terms of other programs that other counties may offer, is there any collaboration with that? I'm just thinking we used to have aviation maintenance. And now we don't because nobody took a job in Frederick County that went to BWI or Dulles. Are we taking or leveraging any programs that might be offered in another county and can that kind of thing happen? Not currently. Um, okay. Yeah, not currently. We certainly communicate very frequently with our colleagues and, um, and talk about successful programs, but we haven't, to my knowledge, had any of our students that go to another county to take a program. Okay. And this is probably my dumb question for the afternoon or morning. Um, it, it, so if three courses is a completer and two is a concentrator, what is one? Just an elective. Just an elective, okay. Just I didn't know if the title. Intro course or, you know. Yeah, or, okay. So it's good that you've been able to take it down to a three-course uh, sequence or pathway. Um, 
I was wondering though, like welding, um, does that does that fall under? See, I see it looking here, wood and metal. Is that under mechanics or is that under agriculture? So we have two different welding programs. We have our program at the Career and Tech Center, which okay. ends in um, AWS certification. And then we have an ag program at four of our comprehensive high schools that is ag mechanics that also okay. includes welding, small engines and power, um, and then the wood and metal. So um, some of those students do also get AWS uh, certification as well. So, um, but they do ultimately end up with a small engines uh, certification. So two different programs. And again, we try to provide opportunities for all students. If they take the first course at their comprehensive school, um, they can certainly then parlay that over to the Career and Tech Center. What four high schools offer that? Uh, Walkersville, Linganore, Catoctin, and Brunswick. Oh, imagine that. Okay. <laughs> Would have been yeah. my <laughs> yeah. Um, and then work study. When you talk about work study, and I see Perkins in the same presentation, are they related as they would be at the higher ed? Yes. Yes. So ultimately, um, work study now falls under the program of study called Career Research and Development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, that's the guided experience, and um, we're preparing students again for a career, not just a job. So it's really kind of getting them to do with they they complete a lot of self assessments, skill assessments, uh, a lot of scenarios, you know, preparing for situations like sexual harassment or, you know, sadly, some of the workplace experiences that we do have today and um, the advanced courses take taken simultaneously or concurrently with the work-based learning experience so that they can really meld the experience with the educational aspect of having a job. So that's actually a program of study. Okay. And also on the accounting side, are, are we doing it? It says dual enrollment. Like at what point would that happen for something like accounting? Norm? Uh, that That's a uh, advanced accounting. I think it, matches up with there's a dual enrollment course at most of the the third courses in the, the okay. final courses you could have a dual enrollment As, okay. and i know from our articulation agreement our intro accounting and the advanced articulate to your accounting one right okay 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 that's good i mean i think it's a wonderful program i'm uh uh, mentoring a student, one of we had the six hundred and something thousand dollar NSF grant for uh, underrepresented or financially uh, students without financial means to really pursue um, higher education, uh, and and I'm mentoring a student, and I was completely impressed when I saw his transcript, and he he's transferred in, I think it was either twenty seven or thirty two credits from his high school, and so he's going to double major. At FCC, we spent three hours on the phone on Sunday looking at um, what he should take remaining at FCC to get like two degrees at FCC and then transfer to UMBC. So he's just, I mean, as a freshman first semester, he's, you know, he's going to leave FCC with like, I don't know how many credits, only 60 of them will go with him, but he's going to wind up with two degrees at FCC before he transfers to his four-year school. So I think it's wonderful that we have these programs for highly motivated students and, um, and I think the more collaboration, the better. And I, I'll encourage that. So, you know, particularly in, in dual enrollment, that's just been explosive growth, you know, on both sides, uh, you know, because it, it's a co collaborative uh, effort there. So, OK, I, that's all the questions I had. Um, the only other last thing would be in terms of you talked about the, the traditional like CompTIA certifications and CCNA. What about um, like certified ethical hacker and like some of the, you know, the cybersecurity uh, industry certifications like CISSP and that stuff? Norm? That's probably more to career and tech center, right? Don't we have a new program? We you have a new, pro a new program that will be coming next year in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's part of the Cisco Academy, but it's a new kind of pathway. Okay. Um, and we're still working to develop that. So we, we know the courses because we're putting them in the course guide. Um, we're just trying to develop all of the industry certifications that will go along with that. Okay. Yeah. That's it. 
thank you for this is the kind of like Mr. J. This is this is right up my alley as well. So uh, I, I uh, really appreciate everybody's hard work. I know we do great things for our students, you know, at all, all levels. And uh, again, I really appreciate everybody's effort and the opportunity for you to take the time to explain and answer all my questions. So before Karen um, asks her questions, I do want to share that next Friday is our next advisory council meeting. It will be virtual and our focus will be on it. And it's our advisory council is with FCC. So it's the FCC FCPS advisory council. Um, and so if anyone would like to participate, I'll be happy to add you to the, uh, the announcement that will go out next week with the link. I'm not sure though with the new board, if Jay is still our uh, representative or if that's changed. It is changing. It is Brad. It's going to be Brad, yes. And, and we we let, you know, Brad's done a few things for the board and he said CT, uh, CTE, CTC was not a committee he'd ever done. And so uh, Jay gave in to him because these two also requested it. It's very popular, very popular. Yeah, no so, doubt. Oh yeah. Brad, so. Um, yes, we. I think all of us are in agreement. We would love to expand the program, and and you know, of course, this this um, budget year was uh, just very very sad with uh, the pandemic kind of crushing all of our hopes and dreams for a lot of other things. So uh, it'll be a while before we get to dream that big again. But you know, you can see they work hard to make improvements everywhere they can. So thank you certainly for that. Um, okay, yes couple of questions. Oh, I just wanted to say, yes, as far as um, the, uh, from the DTI, I know a lot of us are on um, communicating communications with state organizations. So, you know, Dr. Alban is with PAZAM and they, I think they speak weekly. I'm uh, with the Maryland Association of Boards of Ed, MABE uh, Legislative Committee. And I know when I mentioned this earlier after it had been presented to us, um, there were other counties that were very interested in, you know, how to uh, provide that uh, um, capability through the virtual world. So it's good to get the word out, and a lot of us do that. Um, let's see. Good. To, okay. So I'm also glad that we went from four down to three. That just seems so much more manageable. That fourth one, I just even remember in college, it could be really hard to get things happen. Um, but I'm going to play devil's advocate because I know you're responding to what the state wants, what the federal government is looking at, um, the popularity and focus on CTE programs. But is the, the idea that maybe we're requiring, and this is more just in general, that we're requiring students to focus too early? Should we be looking at not just middle school, but middle and high is the opportunity for kids to dabble and explore. And by requiring these completers, and again, I'm playing devil's advocate, um, are we maybe uh, shortchanging students out of um, being able to just dabble a little bit more and explore? So if you could speak to that. You know, when I, when I first got into CTE, I first was a middle school teacher, then became a high school teacher, and then came here. And as a parent of three students that went through FCPS, I did feel like, well, I want them to have opportunity. I want them to explore. But once I really understood the intent of the program and the value added in participating in a whole program, um, we have students that are, that are leaving some of our programs and going right to the workforce. And because of the industry certifications and the knowledge that they have gained. And so that opens up opportunities for our students so that they have on and off ramps. They can work and pay their way through college. You know, they may decide to work for a while and then go to college. They may decide to make a career in whatever the area is and not have the need to go to college. Or they may decide later to go back to places like our Monroe Center and get certifications. So. I understand what you're saying, but I also see significant value in being able to focus. And I do think it's a different world now. I do think our expectation of students is that they leave high school with a toolbox full of tools. And I think this provides that opportunity. 
Thank you for addressing that. I just think that's something, you know, my husband actually brings up to me, but they don't get to take woodworking, you know, so somebody might have a hobby. So I, I appreciate you addressing that. Yeah, my, my father quit high school in, in the 1940s um, and is a retired nuclear physicist. And I, I think you're right. It's a different world. I don't know that he would have had those opportunities and the military provided a lot of that gap. But um, so I appreciate that. And, another and, and, and can I say something? Yeah. And, and if you think about going to three courses, that gives the opportunity for a person to take one more mm -hmm. course that they really, maybe I want to take that computer science course that I, you know, I, I wouldn't have if I was just in the, the business ed completer, because I would like, well, I know business is important, but I also know computer science is. So now let me take that as my fourth course, or let me take, uh, ag as a, a fourth course because I want to go into farming, but I know business is important. So that that fourth option now provides a lot more flexibility because I already have my completer. So let that me do my focus. The other thing that we're doing is encouraging um, our counselors to talk to students. Typically, when students come into high school, the counselor's thought is, let's get them in financial literacy requirement right away. Mm -hmm. um, we have embedded financial literacy options in many of our programs of study. So we're saying, take a look at the student interest. And if they're interested in business, let's get them an intro to business as their financial literacy, because that's already one. And we can double dip with the financial literacy and intro to business mm -hmm. or in a child development program. We actually have, I think, a, a very successful um, financial literacy component in the fourth course, which is all about running your own child development program and looking at, you know, the taxes and the loans and, and income from students and all of that. So we're really trying to create contextual financial literacy opportunities within the content. So again, that has the opportunity to free up a credit as well. That, that was a really good point because I was more thinking students would try something, find it wasn't to their liking, and then go to a next, and that would be the fourth one. So I wasn't thinking of the fourth course as being on the other end of, of getting that more exploration. So thank you for putting that in. Um, and another comment to make is that I know for so long, when we talked about college and career ready, it was really just college ready. And mm -hmm. the the career was kind of over there. And I feel like in the last few years, the focus has come on to, okay, you know, college is great, but it's not for everybody. So what are we doing for really, for real in the career ready area? So I'm, I'm glad to hear a lot of this. Um, I wanted to say also um, that, you know, the pandemic, uh, just as I was getting away from pushing everybody to college. And, and full disclosure, my husband's an electrician, been an electrician for a lot of years, 46 years, I think, and uh, has had his own business for the last, last 16 years. So it's done well. The recession was hard. The pandemic has been much better for construction. Um, but you see the statistics of a lot of the kids, a lot of the people, I'm sorry, who have lost their jobs are ones that don't have um, college degrees, but it's more your service workers. So I feel like the career and tech center certifications are, are either at the end of the college degrees or somewhere in the middle and not with like the restaurant workers and, and um, a lot of the venues and things that we've seen shut down. So can you speak to that, what you're seeing, uh, if you've had a chance to kind of look at that uh, data? Yeah, well, I, I can tell from a um, just an experience last week when we met with the foundation for the foundation for the career and technology house project. Mm -hmm. Every one of the industry folks talked about how busy they are, how backed up they are. And um, the students are really enjoying the opportunity to get out there and do hands on at the house project. So that's been terrific. In fact, several students have been asking their teachers, can we go out on Saturdays to work on the house? So I think that's really exciting, but it also speaks to the fact that kids want to um, be, be productive right now. And when they can do so in a, in a safe environment, we definitely want to encourage that. Um, but at least from that industry, we are seeing um, 
and hearing from our folks that they are super busy. Everyone is working on their house right now. Um, a personal experience, I even was looking at some furniture and I heard um, at the furniture store, they're like, well, we're backed up four months because people can't go on vacation. So they're redoing their houses. So we know there are many industries that are thriving in this environment. Very good. Um, and I, uh, I know Dr. Alban has talked about there are some blocks at the state level through MSDE um, as to what can be done virtually. Um, and so I'm hearing you all talk a lot about, you know, what the pandemic world has presented and the opportunities. Um, and, and do you see blockades that we can help with at the state level going forward? So thanks to our board, we were able to bring back students at the Career and Tech Center, as well as our ag mechanics students at the high schools. Um, and then some of our wood design and application students uh, were able to come back as well on a limited afternoon basis. So that's been terrific. Um, I don't feel as though there's been blocks in any areas that required face-to-face uh, -face, with the potential exception of um, just the complexity uh, for some of them. I think our students have done an, I mean, our teachers have done an amazing job of working within the parameters that we have. Norm contacted me recently and said, jump on this link, jump on this link. He was so excited because a family consumer, consumer science teacher was making pancakes with their middle school class. <laughs> and so it's really great to see, and all the kids were in their kitchens. It is so great <laughs> to see what our teachers have been able to come up with. Do you want to talk about that a bit, Norm? Yeah, they, you know, they've taken a lot of risk and that's what I told them. Just take the risk. And in that one, like, I'm like, oh no, that's the wrong oil. Like I could see that kid up there for it. But like there were 30 kids making pancakes, you know, and there were some parents, but some of the kids are sort of on their own. And then somebody else just did a, an event like that. And I know the principal of Middletown, uh, Middle, he actually per participated at home as well. So he made whatever they were making, you know, and what a great opportunity to teach family and consumer science and life skills with all these kids at home. You know, that's what we're like, they're home in their kitchen. So, um, you know, we've had some good things, but uh, I think our teachers can't wait to get back hybrid, some of them, you know, to at least give materials of instruction. And, 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 and that's what we do. We build relationships with kids and, and that's really what we, we want to do so. We began planning for that already. Um, you know, we're excited about that. Very good. And my last question is, are you still planning to do a signing ceremony? And how do you think that will happen? I sure hope so. We had to cancel last year. For the Johnsons, um, we started a uh, career signing day at the end of the year where anyone who intends to go on directly to the workforce, um, we came to FCC and we had a marvelous event. The businesses were up there and uh, had little gifts for the students and the students signed and the businesses signed their intent to work. And it was so successful. Uh, you know, again, we were disappointed we couldn't do that next year. I continue to be very positive and I'm hopeful that we will get back before the end of the school year and be able to do one again this year. That sounds awesome. And that, that, that made it out beyond just like the career programs. That was like news across the campus and it was wonderful. And I actually know students who were very proud about, they were signing to, you know, at um, Shockley Honda, you know, this, the, it was, a, it's wonderful. And at least, you know, at FCC, it was spread across the entire campus. So good, great, right. great work. And we are doing a middle school virtual tech fair and instead of just one day, we're really going to focus on it is CTE month, the month of February. So we'll probably have competitions throughout the month. I already have like four or five ready to go. And we will have our startup Frederick again virtually. We already have that in the works and we're planning for the business startup. Uh, we did that last year. We're going to modify it a little bit. We think it'll even be better, but we're, we're planning on doing those two events as well. Very good. And it sounds like we'd appreciate 
to know about those. I, I know a lot of times you're very good about sending, but uh, make sure we get those invitations. I was going to say to uh, to Sue and Jason, um, there are lots of opportunities to, uh, there were in non-pandemic times to uh, get out there and see what CTE and CTC does. Um, and I'm not sure that you mentioned the open house that CTC used to have um, that was Oh my goodness, you couldn't even park if you didn't get in there early. So if you want to just speak to that briefly. Sure. Mike Concepcion did an amazing job of creating a virtual CTC this year. I went on and you were directed to the individual classes and had a, a great time seeing teachers as well as students sharing um, you know, information about the program. They were actually at the at the CTC building. So they were able to show some of the equipment that used in individual programs. And it was great fun to be able to see the number of parents and future students that were engaged in conversation um, about the programs. So we are extremely hopeful that our enrollment will not be in, for next year, will not be impacted by this and that students will uh, continue to uh, sign up for Career and Tech Center. Yes, it uh, was the in person was wildly popular. As I said, I tried to drop in uh, a couple of years ago, and it's like I didn't have that much time, and you couldn't find parking. So if you didn't get there early, you were kind of kind of out of luck. It was very very popular. So that gets the interest going from the younger students. But I think that's all I have. So thank you very much for your time and and uh, very great intro um, and informational presentation for us. And uh, there's nothing else for the good of the group. Dr. Cuppet, you want to, I guess, go look to future topics and we can say goodbye to Dr. Pearl and Mr. McGackie. Yep. So uh, Linda will probably have a list of what's currently scheduled. I will let you know as, as we move into the January and February timelines, we may come to you with some, some items that are a little more timely. But right now, I think for uh, January, what do we have? Um, Ms. Raines? Uh, we have world language updates and co competency-based education out at Frederick High School. Okay, so that's uh, Dr. Franciscina and uh, Ms. Chappelle will be doing that presentation. And, and that might be a meeting where we add something on uh, if we have some timely issues that are coming up. Okay, very good. I'm sure he appreciates that you got the uh, Italian pronunciation correct because I know a lot of people mispronounce his name. Um, um. So very good. Okay. Yes. And I think that'll be timely uh, since uh, I know uh, Jason had a question to Dr. Alban about the, that type. I think it was Jason of, of grading that type. Um, one of the things that I'm going to be interested in is uh, when they presented before, it was a lot on the teachers. And so maybe what we're, you know, what their advice would be to make it not so much work on the, the teachers at the other schools. So. Okay. All right. Can I ask one more question? I'm sorry. Of course. With, um, with Dr. Pearl's remark about the COMAR and the state mandate to have 45% of the students uh, participating in uh, like a CTC uh, program of study, I have to imagine that the cost per student to enroll and participate in that has got to be higher than uh, a, you know, the, a non you know, program, CTE program. Does anyone have that data? And has anyone done any cost analysis to know how much extra money that would cost us to um, fulfill this mandate? And are we going to get help from anybody? Yeah. So the challenge with, with doing that, um, I'm sure financially, I guess it could be done. But, you know, when you think about FCPS and our, our expenses, you know, 85 or 89% is, is staff, right? So mm -hmm. all of those programs have faculty members that are in there. And so um, that would be one thing you'd have to cost out is, you know, as our staff members that run those programs cost more than, than others. You know, are they more experienced? Do they have more certifications? Uh, and then after that, it would be really materials of instruction would be the next big category um, and equipment would be the other one. So I know that one of the challenges we have in all of our CTE programs is the replacement cycle for certain equipment, right? That's what I was wondering. Yeah. You know, Yep, and uh, when we add new programs, like we just added the um, uh, 
physical rehabilitation program. Uh, we did that under a grant. All the startup costs associated that were done with, uh, I believe might have been the innovation grant. Uh, and so we bought all the equipment and those types of things. Now, replacing that over time is something that we try to manage into our grants. Um, as far as a student's participation in that, I mean, it's conceivably it would be more expensive, but I don't know exactly what kind of financial system we would have to put in place to be able to track that cost. I actually think the overall cost for raising the completer status is going to go down in the sense that you think about the requirement has now been um, dropped from four courses to three. I think there's okay. still a lot of kids taking that fourth course, but from four to three means the overall credits for, for the same goal um, has been reduced for us. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, there's nothing else. I think we stand adjourned. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.